Hey guys, it's Kyle today on 10 Questions. Dan Patrick, legendary broadcaster, radio man. He gets into his whole career starting in rock radio in the 70s. One of his most infamous sports center moments and why he refuses to do hot takes as a broadcaster in 2021. Dan was incredible, so generous. You're going to love this. Dan Patrick, 10 Questions. Bruce Buffer, do your thing. This podcast is scheduled for 10 questions. Fighting out of New York, standing at 5 feet 11 inches tall, and wearing the red, white, and blue trunks, presenting Kyle Brass. Why, thank you, Bruce Buffer. This is going to be a good one. Welcome to 10 Questions, everybody. If you don't know, we don't have conversations here. We have competitions. We don't have guests. We have contestants. Every single person comes in to talk and to compete, and everybody leaves with a score. There's 10 questions, just like the title says. Each question is worth one point. You get the question right, you get a point. You get a question wrong, you get nothing. And we will find out what today's contestant gets. But first, before we bring him in, let's give him a little lay of the land. A few of the prior contestants just get a little sense of some of the competition he might be up against. Roll it, please. I'm Tim Robbins, and I got seven out of 10. Just saying. I'm Mark Cuban. I got a nine out of 10. What's up? I'm Pat McAfee, and I'm a dumbass. I got five out of 10. Good luck with your sport, pal. Will he need the luck today? Let's introduce this man properly, because he is a professional. Here's what you need to know about today's contestant. He loves pesto. Can't get enough pesto. Huge pesto guy. You probably know him best from the major motion picture, The House Bunny. Um, and he is one of the most successful, one of the most well-liked, one of the most even-keeled broadcasters on the entire planet Earth. It is my thrill to say this. Welcome to 10 Questions, Dan Patrick. Thank you, Kyle. How are you today, Dan? Is that one of the questions? No, it's not as literal as you might hope. Oh, this is okay. a, this is get to know you. Oh, because then I'd have one that I got, and we'd be down to nine. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, I see you got your uh, your requisite tight T-shirt on. I appreciate yep. that. As, as always, it's an extra medium, the size that I like it. Dan, do you know what you're in for today with this experience? I have no idea. Are you only? You're not even six feet tall. Five eleven. That's it. Did you no. lie about it in college? Uh, prolifically. Yeah. In the media guide, I think I was 6'2", 240. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I talked to Steve Young and Steve Young, yeah. I said, you're listed as six foot. And he says, I'm 6'2". I said, I've, I've stood next to you. He goes, I, all you have to do your rookie year, they give you a sheet for uh -huh. you fill out for your football card. And he said, I put 6'2". And it stays 6'2 the whole time. And he's barely six feet tall. Wow. All the way to the Hall of Fame. Who knew? See, that's what Dan will bring to this experience. Everybody else is just wishing they could be on his level. Dan, 10 questions. Uh, my promise to you, I, pr I do promise, each of these 10 will have somehow, I will have related them to your life and your career. If at some point you're like, I have no clue, I don't even know what that means. You do have a lifeline here. Our lifeline on 10 questions is called Ask a Millennial. We will bring in a real living, breathing millennial from another window, and you have 30 seconds to talk it over with them. Are you ready to roll? Yes. Here we go. Dan Patrick's 10 questions. Dan, you have the disadvantage of me having a great respect for your intellect. So it, the chatter around the, the clubhouse right now is that these questions are hard. These, this is much harder mm. than, say, oh, I don't know, the Mark Cuban or Eli Manning questions. But let's find out. Question number one. Dan, your first category is home life. Home life. A molded glass jar used to preserve food is known as a what jar? A mason jar. He says rather quickly and rather confidently, a mason jar. Is it a mason jar? It's absolutely right. You are one for one. And why the hell would I bring on someone of your stature and talk about mason jars? Because, Dan, you were raised in Mason, Ohio, yes. outside of Cincinnati. At what point growing up in Mason, Ohio, did you know that you wanted to be in front of some kind of microphone? I know it was around 12 years of age that I wanted to be in sports, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was a sports writer or broadcaster. So I was lucky. I didn't have a plan B. This is all I, you know, I, I planned on doing this and I don't know what I would have done if I, I failed, but you know, they didn't tell you what you needed to do to get in the business. 
I just thought you graduated from college and somebody gives you a job, but uh, I, I was lucky. I knew at 12 and uh, I never stopped you know, dreaming. There's a lot of people who look at what you do and would call it uh, their dream job. When you were 12 or any time growing up, did you have a dream job? Back then it was doing local sports mm-hmm. where, you know, the Cincinnati stations or the Dayton stations that I thought, gosh, I could do that for 30 years and mm-hmm. have a great life. And then all of a sudden cable happened. And when I was in college, we had to decide in our off campus house at the University of Dayton, you could have heat or cable. And we opted for cable. And so we would watch TV in our sleeping bags Mm -hmm. in the living room. But, you know, cable changed me because then I saw ESPN and I thought that's that's where I have to I have to go there. So when you're there in your sleeping bag and you're watching ESPN that you chose over heat, mm-hmm. do you remember some of your first impressions? Like the first thing you saw or went really early ESPN impressions in the sleeping bag? Well, you know, what was great is that if, you know, women came over, then they would have to get in the sleeping bag. So I'm just saying, you know, sometimes I didn't get to watch an entire sports center, but um, you know, it, it, it was still, I couldn't, I, I it was like, they're talking sports 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. I mean, that, that was Nirvana to me because I thought, you know, instead of doing local sports where you're doing three to four minutes Mm -hmm. there, you get to do an hour. And I actually filmed an audition tape and I sent it to Bob Lee. Mm -hmm. And so Bob's on sports center and I'm nobody in Dayton, Ohio. And I said, would you critique this? And Bob wrote me a letter critiquing. And I, and he said, you're not there yet but you have the potential, you know, to do this, whether, you know, he believed that or not. And then it was uh, a little over six years later, I'm sitting next to him on sports center. Crazy. Wow. What do you think yeah. that tape looks like if we were to watch it right now? Do you remember the tape? Um, I might've had a, a unibrow and <laughs> my hair probably wasn't great, but all I did was I ad libbed five minutes of sports. And I also did an interview with Joe Garagiola the old baseball guy. He came into Dayton, sat down, we did an interview and I edited that. I I probably had 10 minutes of sports on there. I'm sure it looks pretty rough, but I did know my stuff. I didn't look good. I I actually lost the job at channel two in Dayton, Ohio, because the guy who got the job, Ken Kettering was blonde hair, blue eye. He was just better looking. Sure. And, and he even said, look, you know, more sports than I do. And you know, I mean, he was kind of a pretty boy like you that I don't know if he had a lot of substance, but, you know, he did look good on camera. And, you know, that's half the battle. Are you, are you kidding me? It's 90 percent. Um, <laughs> it is interesting to me, though, Dan, before we go to question two, there's a great irony that you ended up doing what you do in a sense because you chose cable over heat. And then there you are on ESPN saying on fuego of all things and yes. on fire. It's, yes. it's, it's unbelievable. Yes, yes. One for one, Dan. Let's see. Speaking of on fuego, let's see if we can start two for two. This I'm really looking forward to this question because it's a portion of your life I don't know much about. Question number two, your category is classic rock. Let's go to July of 1981. You are working at WTUE Radio in Dayton, Ohio. It is a rock formatted station. I looked up the number one song on the rock charts at that time in July of 81. It was a song called Urgent. What band was it by? A band that should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Foreigner. He says Foreigner quickly. He is absolutely right. And can we, for the love of God, can we get some urgent up here and just rock out for a little bit? WT, we good memories, Dan, listening to this one. I love that you bring Hall of Fame takes too. They are one of the one of the outliers that you think should yes. be in, Foreigner. You know the bigger song back then. Tell me. Betty Davis Eyes. Is that Foreigner? I'm not familiar with that song. No. Uh, Kim Carnes. <laughs> she's got Betty Davis Eyes. That was the big song back then at that okay. time, that summer. And Jesse's Girl by Rick Springfield. Yes. You know, I was going to choose Jesse's Girl. I thought it'd be too, too, too difficult. Urgent yeah. is sort of like, I don't know, it's Foreigner's maybe eighth or ninth hit. and They you should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They should. They, Why they, they, do they had hit. I don't know how that works. Mm-hmm. That, you know, Green Day's in and, and Foreigner's yeah. not. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, come on. 
let's let's honor those who came before you. And Foreigner deserves to be. I've never went to a concert, never met any of those guys. I just feel like it's an injustice that Foreigner is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. If you go to see the Foreigner as they are now, I think it's still the singer who has the rights. Or even if you go to a Foreigner tribute band, I mean, they have double digit instantly recognizable songs that are yeah. a whole part of the culture. You can't do that generation without Foreigner. I, I just know how they're not in. Yeah, yeah. And and I thought that they had, like Lover Boy. I think, wanted to be Foreigner. You know, I think there were a lot. Of, I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> but but I, I, I'm i I'm on that bandwagon. You know, I fought hard to get John Facenda into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. That we did a campaign. I wrote a letter. I called, you know, the, the Hall of Fame. And I, I just said, this is a disservice. Mm-hmm. And David Baker said, we'll fix it. And uh, Foreigner is next. That's my next, okay. you know, I'm going to champion that cause. And, and I, I will be happy to lend my support. I, I think oh, Foreigner walked great. so, you know, so Night Ranger could run. Uh, but I'm not asking you all about Foreigner. Um, Dan, do you ever think, what would have happened if you had stayed in music? Is, is this sports thing just never happened or you never pursued it. You were a music guy from start to finish because obviously there's a passion there. I would probably be on classic vinyl, on Sirius, and I would be, you know, following Alan Hunter on classic rewind or something, but, uh, or Nina Blackwood, but yeah, I, I love music. Like I like sports. Mm-hmm. I love music, mm-hmm. all kinds of music, but I, I would probably be doing something like that, hosting yeah. something like that. Um, best and worst concert you've ever attended. Um, that I can't say best because I had a run in the seventies. Well, no, in the eighties where I had stones, Zeppelin, who Bowie Aerosmith. Oh my God. And you can't pick. no, I, I, I think just Jagger back at, at, in that time that I saw him had the uh, Eagles Jersey on in the football <laughs> pants and they had a, a large penis that came out of the stadium. Okay. And um, just seeing the Stones and understand, not like I'm a Zeppelin fan, but yeah. seeing the Stones, seeing Mick and Keith, uh, I would say that one would probably stand out over the other ones. But they were all great because they were, Bowie, this was after Ziggy Stardust, he wore the all white uh, suit and he was spectacular. But mm-hmm. I, I would say the Stones. Did you have one you went to that maybe you were really looking forward to it and respected the artist and just was a complete letdown for some oh, reason? Bob Dylan came out with his uh, Born Again album, Slow Train. And while I love that album, and, and he played in a small club, he played no hits. Uh, and everybody's yelling out, like a rolling stone! And, and Bob just plowed through, didn't play anything <laughs> other than the songs from that album. Right. Yeah. So that was disappointing because I didn't, I didn't hear, um, and I, I was supposed to go see Frank Sinatra late in his uh-huh. life and decided not to because I didn't, I didn't want to be disappointed. Sure. I didn't want to go and have him reading off a teleprompter, uh, forgetting words. I, I didn't want to do that, and I, and I didn't see Sinatra. Probably smart. They say don't meet your heroes, but don't go to them in concert when they're reading Strictly Taboo off a teleprompter either. And like you, know, you can't do that. Dan, you got um, a mason jar and you got Foreigner really quickly. Here we go now. We're getting into the meat of things. You still have your lifeline here. And here's contestants' choice. I have two categories for you for question three, Dan. You can choose whatever is more appealing to you. Would you like to choose the category Mark Wahlberg or fried chicken? Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg. Okay. Dan Patrick, to go three out of three, what Mark Wahlberg movie has a character named The Colonel? I'll go Lifeline. I'll go Lifeline. Okay, bring the Lifeline in. This is gonna be Richie Bozak. He is a young uh, millennial gentleman. Richie, this is Dan Patrick. Say hello. Dan Patrick, it's so great to meet you. Hopefully he can Hi, help bud. you out here. All right. Okay. All right. So you heard that he chose Mark Wahlberg, Richie. And uh, the question, you're going to have 30 seconds to make magic between the two of you. Sometime, Richie um, really, really screwed over Brett Favre. 
but he helped Vigo Mortensen. So it's a grab bag. You don't know, Dan. It's hit or miss. 30 seconds. What Mark Wahlberg movie has a character named The Colonel? Go ahead. Dan, I'm struggling to think of it off the top. Oh. I'm th- do, you, do you have like any idea what, what year this might be? What Was there a year like... Um, the Colonel. The Colonel. Infamous character. Assuming it's, you know, some military or... Mm. Was was he uh, when he was that sniper <laughs> shooter? But, yeah, yeah, that's a good call, I mean, man. That sounds like a good. Would Cal just give us the answer like that, though? I mean, Richie, do you have anything to offer? I mean, shooter sounds good. Shooter sounds promising. Okay. Yeah, go back to playing your damn video games. Yeah, you go on. Me nothing. Go start an app. Go fake. <laughs> Whatever you do, I'm gonna need an answer. Mark Wahlberg movie uh, with a character named the Colonel. Uh, shooter. Shooter uh, is is a really great guess. It is unfortunately <laughs> not correct. <laughs> you did it logically. There's an infamous character in a movie called Boogie Nights, starring Mark Wahlberg, uh, named the Colonel, uh, who ends up funding the whole um, Burt Reynolds uh, porn ring and everything. But I'm asking you about this not because mm. of the Colonel, but because of the Eastern Kentucky Colonels, for which oh, you used to play, oh, Dan. Oh. I, I've known about your career and followed it for a long time. I didn't know much about you and college basketball. You grew up in Ohio. You're, you're a good basketball player. You're tall. You got a scholarship to play basketball at Eastern Kentucky. Please tell us about that and what your experience was there. The older I get, the better I was. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I had a coach who did not like me. He called me Golden Boy. Never called me by my name. He called me Golden Boy. And in a derogatory way. Uh-huh. And the, I guess the more time I spent on the bench, the more time that I did not cut my hair. And I, I, I was not going to cut my hair until I got to play. So, you know, I, I had Fabio type hair because I was just sitting watching. And I remember that I came to him when I was ready to transfer to Dayton and he didn't even turn around at his desk. I said, coach, I'm going to transfer. And, and he had this, by golly, kind of delivery. And he said, I think that's a good idea. And that was it. So I just walked out. I didn't even get into his office. I just was at the door and he had his back turned. I said, coach, need to talk to you. Uh, think about transfer at the University of Dayton. And he said, I think that's a good idea. And then that was it. So, yeah, not a lot of great memories wow. at all. But um, I did get a nickname. You know, Golden Boy. All right, so what's what's the origin of Golden Boy? Was it about your upbringing or something? Why did he call you that? I think he thought that I I thought I was special. Now, look, he made the right call in not playing me. <laughs> Let me put it that way. But, you know, in my mind, I was as good a shooter as we had. Mm-hmm. He just, and we weren't any good. Like, it's one thing to not play. It's another thing when you don't get to play on a team that's not any good. Mm-hmm. that's when it really hurts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so I, I don't know. I was like, I'm going to show you. And then it, it, it didn't go well. It didn't go well. Well, the growing the hair out was very rock and roll as an act that's of rebellion. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> really, that was, the, I mean, what are we talking about here? This is the, the late seventies. Uh, when mid, was this? Mid, mid seventies. Oh yeah. 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 I was killing it back then. So buried in the lead of of the self-deprecation and this coach who sounds like a jerk was that you felt you were the best shooter. Yeah. Like Dan, um, is the jumper still wet, as they say? And have you ever competed against like any other like athletes who are professionals now? Don't don't ask a question, you know the answer. I, I have no idea what you mean. I would you, never do that. This is off the know, top of my you head. You know that I've got a man cave with a basketball court I do know here. That. And and, and it's not wet. I mean, you know, when <laughs> splash, okay, if the kids want to call it that, I just, you know, I, I, that it's not a coincidence that next to the man cave is a fire department. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just letting you know. All right. To hose you off, should you hit three or four in a row? <laughs> the net. The net. <laughs> the net. Right. Yes. Not me. The net. Would you play? I, I've heard great great war stories about the pickup games at ESPN. Would you play there? I played one, uh, well, I played one time when it was just the anchors. Okay. And, and, and I remember telling them 
that I didn't want to play because if you're scoring on, I mean, it, it, there wasn't any competition really. Okay. Um, you know, John Butchergrass could play a little bit. Uh, Van Pelt can shoot. Sure. But I said, look, can I just run up and down the floor and, and just get a sweat going? That's it. it if, if we can do that, then I'll do it. If not, I, I, you know, I just don't want to have, you know, knock down, drag out people sure. picking me up full court. Well, as soon as we start, I get the ball in bounds. Okay. Stuart Scott picks me up full court. He's got his goggles on. He's got his Air Jordan. I mean, you know, he's trying to be Patrick Beverly. And, he, and he's bodying me and forearm and hand checking. And, and I know this isn't going to go well. Mm -hmm. And it got at, at one point, I was so mad because all I wanted to do was run up and down the floor, have some laughs. Sure. And Stuart is, was ultra competitive. So finally, I'm, I am dribbling the ball down the floor. I can tell you where I am in this gym. And I said, where do you want me to fucking score on you? <laughs> I, I, I'm saying it to Stuart. He didn't say yeah. anything. And so then we got to the end of the game and it was, we needed one more basket. I went in for a layup. Stuart thought he was going to block it. He cuts my legs out from underneath me. I land on my tailbone. Mm. Now I'm out on my, I'm, I'm, they, they need to take me to the hospital. I go sit in the bleachers for probably five minutes. And then I finally said, fuck it, let's go. And they go, Oh no, the game's over. I said, no, it's not. Give me the ball. And so made the shot, got in my car. It was a red Jeep Cherokee. I drove over the, you know, you had the, the center where you, you know, you come in and drop people off. Sure. I, I drove over. I, I was so out of my head and I drove to the hospital and I went in there. I had a, a chip uh, vertebrae and I just remember that I had to do sports center that night. And I was like, this is what, this was my worst nightmare. I just didn't want to play. And, and the other games we'd play were really competitive. That one was supposed to be fun, but Stuart, you know, he was the one who picked me up full court the entire game. And, and then undercut you as you yep. elevated with, when that happens, then is there, there's the, is there, are there shoves? Does everyone jumping in? Is, is Eisen coming? I mean, who, what's going on on the court? Eisen's throwing elbows. What is it? No, Eisen, Eisen wouldn't have been there. Um, no, I just landed and everybody stopped and they knew that I was in trouble. And then I just, I was like, I'm, I got to finish this thing. Oh and, uh, you know, I figured Stuart respected that. Yeah. You know, it was a cheap shot because he was trying to block it and he was not going to uh -huh. block my, my layup, but, uh, yeah, it, it was a little tense there, Damn. but I didn't anchor with Stewart. So it wasn't one of those, but we had to do sports center together. You know, we went to our separate corners there. Um, last question on that, Dan, if you had to, if you had to run fives and you had your pick of anybody who ever, you ever worked with at ESPN for a big, big game, it's you and what four guys on the team. Oh, big money game. Um, I guess I'd take Van Pelt. Mm -hmm. Height. Yeah. Good locker room guy. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, who else was Greg Anthony was really good. I mean, the guys that played in the NBA. Take whoever you want. I heard Anthony was a maniac on those courts. Yes. He didn't have range though. Good shooter. Sure. Uh, legs. I'd take Tim Legler. Legler. Yeah. Legler. Although I don't want to get too many guys who like to shoot too much. Um, yeah. Maybe I mean, Jay Billis. Maybe Billis do some dirty work there. Uh, oh, yeah. And it's a great motivational speech, a, a lot of statistics. Although that sounds like a squad. Let me take Gottlieb because he'll be like, why didn't you take me? So I'll take Doug Gottlieb. <laughs> he can't shoot. All right, Gottlieb. I think coming off the bench as a sixth man, Doug, he got you in here. And uh, on the topic of good shooters, uh, Dan Patrick – Almost hit the three, but he did not. He is two out of three. Question number four. Dan, now we get into the multimedia produced element of this, which I know you would understand as smooth as your radio show sounds. Question number four is name the movie. I'm going to play a clip from a movie. All you have to do is say what the movie is. If you say the name of the movie right, you get the point, and then we'll get into it. Question number four, name the movie. Dan Patrick, what is this film? Jesus, man, could you change the channel? Fuck you, man. If you don't like my fucking music, get your own fucking cab. I had a really I'll rough... I'll pull up to the side and kick your ass out. Man, come on. I had a rough night, and I hate the fucking Eagles, man. What is it? It sounded like...
like Samuel L. Jackson there. It did. It seems to be he's in a cab and someone says, can you turn off the music? And he says, oh, fuck you, man, fuck you, man. And it's sort of Samuel L. Jackson way. And then he says, I had a rough night and I hate the fucking Eagles. Recognize that scene. I was thinking of the Mark Wahlberg movie or a Silver Lining Playbook mm. because they had the Eagles in there. Ah, you're right. God, Dan, you see the Matrix. You get it. We had classic rock already. Yeah. I'd be su- I would be willing to bet that with the gentleman who says I hate the Eagles has been on the Dan Patrick show. Pretty iconic actor. Cult classic movie. It's all legal will allow me to say. But uh, do you want to hear it again? Hold on. Hold on. Okay, give it to me one Pump more time. Pump it up time. and play it again, please. Jesus, man, could you change the channel? Fuck you, man. If you don't like my fucking music, no, get your no, own I got fucking cab. Uh, Big Lebowski. Really yeah, Patrick. <laughs> uh, perfectly legal to play it twice. McConaughey played the same clip like seven times in a row. How did you? How did you have it registered? What? What? Tip I top? just heard Jeff's voice. I know. So. And and I, unless it was Starman with Jeff Bridges, then you know I thought Big Lebowski. And you said it was a classic, so yeah, uh, yeah. Jeff Starman Bridges. with Jeff Bridges and like a an on fire Karen Allen at the I time. I liked Karen Allen. Days. Yes, Absolutely. that was Karen Allen before Raiders, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, it was, she got she she hit, heated up right there in the middle of the eighties. I'm not asking you though about the Jeff Bridges part. Uh, the Big Lebowski. I used to watch Sports Center uh, all the time, as everybody did, and I would always be curious for me that it was called Sports Center, and then you guys would start and say, "This is the Big Show" or "Welcome to the Big Show." So the Big Lebowski, the Big Show. Why did you guys call it the Big Show? We were mocking ourselves. We we didn't know who was watching. So I remember Oberman said, "You know, Ed Sullivan would say we got a really really big show," and he said, "You know, we should call it the Big Show," and I said, "Yeah." And I think people thought in-house at, at uh, the mothership, like we were full of ourselves, which we probably were, but that we, were, we weren't sports center. We were called the big show. But we just did it because we're kind of mocking the, I don't know who's, how many people are watching. Back mm-hmm. then, you didn't get daily returns here on, hey, yeah. a million people are watching. <laughs> Whatever it was, we're like, welcome to the big show. And then you had... The six o'clock sports center with Bob Lee and Charlie Steiner, and Robin Roberts. And then that welcome to happy hour was another one. Like everybody. And then we finally got yelled at by management and said, sure. you will call it sports center. <laughs> and uh, we went on the air that night. And I remember we went to break. So the end of the first 15 minutes, the A block. And it was like coming up, blah, 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 blah. This it yelled. This is Sports Center, <laughs> and we were like, "All right, if that's what you want us to do, we're going to call it." And then they came up with the ad campaign off of that. Of this is Sports Center, was based off of that. But we got yelled at. Uh, Overman and I got yelled at for calling it the Big Show. Wow. So the "This is Sports Center" catchphrase came from essentially you guys mocking management for who was on you for mocking the show title. Yes. Wow. Uh, well, back one, then they didn't embrace us though, Kyle, like uh-huh. today. And it was better because we were trying to get away with shit every night. Like we, we would make fun of our bosses. Keith would make fun of one of our right. bosses who would come out of his office when we're writing sports center and the boss would say, hello. <laughs> so, and, and so Keith, whenever a ball would go through somebody's legs, uh, you know, there'd be an error. He'd go, hello. So he's, He's we're making fun of our boss on the air mm-hmm. and we're just thinking, all right, you know, maybe they'll notice, maybe they're staying up to watch this. Maybe not. Let's test that. But it became that we were having inside jokes and then we'd have a joke about the inside joke. Uh, <laughs> and then we got yelled at by management. Well, and we're going to get to this in a minute, but it all sounds, it sounds very Howard Stern talking about pig vomit and joking about the production manager and all that. And I know that, that's a big part of some of your inspiration. And we're going to talk about Howard in a second, but something you jumped out to me that you said, Dan, is you were talking about you and Keith and you kind of threw it away and said, if, if they thought we were full of ourselves, which we probably were, let's jump in and just do a quick e- ego measuring between Dan and Keith at the height of this is sports center and the big show and everything. Where would you rate the two of the uh, respective egos as they compared to each other? 
Well, Keith had every right to have a, a larger ego. I always thought that I was going to be found out. I was going to be fired. Like I, I just, they never gave you confidence. Mm. Like there was, they didn't instill confidence and Keith didn't care, but I did, you know, I was waiting for that reward, that treat like, Hey, you did a great job. Never got it. And as a result, you I, like, I, I, every single night I thought I had to prove myself every single night. And I, I, you know, it really, it took the joy out of it. And finally, every single night I would get the tape of sports center I'd get done with the show and I'd get the, the air check and I would take it upstairs, put it in the machine and I would watch the re air. And I was watching for my mistakes. I was, I was, you know, the cadence of how you do a highlight, like all of this. Finally, Keith came by one night as we finished the show and he goes, you got the fucking job. What are you looking at? And, and he was so right. He said, why aren't you the same person off the air as you can be on the air? And he was right. I was trying to be perfect. I was, I was trying to play the role of the straight man. And Keith kind of just said, look, just be yourself. And, you know, it's always weird when somebody says be yourself because you don't know who you really are. No idea. Like, okay, be yourself. I don't know what that means. No. And, you know, I think that that was the moment that probably changed my career there because we sort of embraced what we were doing. It was live. We never read each other's copy. We never knew what the other one was going to say. We truly tried to entertain one another. And, uh, you know, he's the best teammate I ever had. He's the most talented guy I've ever worked with. Um, but he just kind of ran his course there of I've mastered this. And I think he gets bored easily where I was still trying to master it. And, uh, you know, I stayed a lot longer I, I stayed there 18 years, but Keith and I were only together five and a half years, but you know, we were, we were very lucky at that time to do what we were doing, but you know, Keith, Keith never lacked confidence. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. No, nor should he have. And when he says, no. Just just the be yourself thing. I think all these years later, Dan, when I listen to you on the radio, it never seems like you're trying to be anything else or trying to put on some kind of show or something. And I think it's really relatable. You're three out of four. Question number five, we're getting the halfway points. We make the turn. Question number five though, Dan, your category is tattoos. Tattoos. Okay. In the very first Simpsons Christmas episode, what member of the family gets a tattoo that says moth, M-O-T-H, moth. Who gets that? Um, what do you think? I'll say Bart. He says Bart. He takes a shot at Bart. Does Bart get a tattoo that says moth? He does, Dan. You're right. Um, he guess. was going to... He was going to get a tattoo that said mother and then Marge caught him and stopped it. And it just said moth. And then they spent all the money removing it. I'm asking you about <laughs> that, not because of tattoos. But Dan, do you have any tattoos? Yes, I do. What do you have? Personal or public? I got a butterfly. Here, let me pull down my pants. Oh, I got yeah. a <laughs> Take it out. Let's go. <laughs> uh, I, I got big show on my back. Um, and uh, no, I don't. I, no. I don't. Well, oh, my God. Thank God. I thought for a second, Dan, <laughs> I know you've done a lot of movies. That was really good acting. I, I'm like, holy shit. Dan got big show on his back. I just lost so much respect. But thank God you did not. Yeah, oh, uh, all right. I, I have uh, my wife's name on my finger. I've oh, got cool. some tattoos on uh, my arms. I uh, got a few of them. I got uh, seven tattoos. Seven. Um, yeah. I'd love to spend yeah. more time talking about tattoos, but I brought up Bart. Because I want to go to the 2003 Major League Baseball National League Championship Series. Uh, it was game six at Wrigley Field. It was the Marlins versus the Cubs. Luis Castillo <laughs> hits a high foul ball towards the left field line. Moises Alou goes up to catch it, but it's blocked and obstructed by a Cubs fan. Incredibly, in this great get, uh, Sports Center finds this Cub fan who is worldwide notorious and puts him on live television with Dan Patrick. I remember where I was when I was watching this. It was at my girlfriend's futon in downtown Chicago. I'd like to play the clip here of Dan talking to Steve Bartman on the air. And everybody, please make sure to listen through the pregnant pause at the end where we can hear Dan's recovery to the word having something to do with cheese. Here we go after the 2003 NLCS. Let's roll it. 
Have you received death threats? Steve? Yes, I have received uh, at least five death threats. Um, uh, calling my parents' house, and and you know people get you know especially from the news they've been calling, and and I and I'm pretty much right now um in, you know hiding out right now. Can you stay in the Chicago area? Um, do you like Howard Stern's butt cheese? Hello. We've been had. That was not Steve Bartman. Okay, what's it like to listen to that back? Oh, you know what? The person who greenlit the phone call to come through is a, a great friend. And, you know, we, we didn't properly vet it, mm -hmm. obviously. But it makes me, in the moment, right before, I'm, I got a chance to talk to him a little bit before we went on the air. And to this day, and how long ago has that been, Kyle? It's been 18 years. I beat myself up over the fact that I wanted to ask him about the football team at his alma mater. I wanted to test him because mm. he went to Notre Dame. I see. And, at, and I just thought, okay, this is him. I don't know if it's him. I've never spoken to him before. And I wanted to say, hey, you know, how, or something about your football team. And now he could have bullshit through that, but sure. I don't know if he would have known that, you know, Bartman went to Notre Dame, mm -hmm. but it, that comes to mind. Not that, you know, you get out. I mean, it's live TV, but, uh, but it was still, it was one of those where I went, I, I should have just asked a, a question. Maybe, maybe he would have said something that, you know, would have tipped us off, but I, you know, I was pretty lucky given that you spent 18 years on live TV and you don't have too many of those moments, but that was one of those where you just said, and that's captain Jenks from Howard Stern show. Mm -hmm. And I've since, you know, we since had a kind of a truce. I said, look, you got me just promise me you won't do it again. And, and he promised that he wouldn't do it again. The recovery is an all timer. And I know you do a lot for young broadcasters and young people who want to get into broadcasting, it was the, an unbelievable display of poise because you're cruising and you're grilling them and out of nowhere, of all things, butt cheese. And you wait and you look down, you take a <laughs> breath and you look up and you say, we've been had, which is yeah. not an expression anybody <laughs> says anymore. It's a 70 year old classic vintage expression. And then yeah. Dan, people have to go watch the clip. You segue seamlessly into <laughs> coming up, Factor Fiction, and uh, Warren Sapp goes from the hunter to the hunted. How, how, take me into the moment between butt cheese and we've been had. How did you do that? I don't know. <laughs> I truly don't. I, I, it, it was just in the moment, and then I, I paused because I, I almost wanted to have reverence to it because they got me. So oh, I'm like, oh, let it, let it breathe, you, you know, cause I'm thinking in my mind, fucking got me. Yeah. And then I just go, we've been had mm -hmm. still to come on sports. Like it would, there was nothing I could do. It was just like, all right, let me say goodbye to this. You got me. And you know, we move on and we went to commercial break and it's just one of those where you go, Oh my God, mm -hmm. I'm going to get mm -hmm. crushed for this. Cause everybody was like, Oh, you got, you know, Bartman and, you know, people are, oh, this is great. We got Bartman, you know, and then all of a sudden we, we got Bartman. We didn't get Bartman. <laughs> rough. That was rough. Uh, yeah. It couldn't, it was rough, but it, you couldn't have made it go any smoother. And as we go on to question six, Dan, you're doing very, very well. You got the Bart Simpson question. You're four out of five. And we get to the category in question six called late night. This is late nights. Dan, in 1995, what actress flashed David Letterman on his own show? That would be... Uh, she was in E.T. She had a daytime show. Uh, her grandfather was a famous actor. Yes. Um, why is it I cannot... I keep saying Reese. Um, yeah, it's not Reese Witherspoon. No, it's not. Um, you can picture her, can't you? you yes, can I can. yes, I can. Yes, I can. Her name. 
And I've been in movies with her with Sandler. Yeah, she she, is, she and Sandler have done she a bunch in, of stuff. She was in Blended. Yep. 51st, 51st Dates. First dates. And I, and she's adorable. Yeah, everybody seems to really like her. Um, yes. And she got on Dave's desk, turned her back to the camera, yep. pulled her shirt up, yep. got down. Yep. But what was her name, Dan? You know it. Uh, Dan has I'm looking used to see if I, I'm going to, no, I'm not going to use a lifeline. No, it's I, over. I, I, I got... I'm looking to see if I have that movie poster That's in my fair. man. That's fair. Go ahead. Drew Barrymore. He got Drew Barrymore. Now, Dan, did you pull it off the 51st States poster, which I'm fine with? No, blended. Ah, uh, it is Drew Barrymore. How, how much better do you feel now? I feel great. Oh, because I, I I was around her for a couple of movies. I'm thinking, I, I why is it I know everything about her, but I don't know her name? No. Oh, that would have been rough. Okay. You got, got it. it. You are Ooh. now at five points. You've already passed both Bill Simmons and Bill Pullman, uh, as well as Steve Smith Sr. So you're doing really well. Five out of six. I asked that because of the Barrymore thing on Letterman. Dan, what would you say is your favorite type of guest on your show? Just somebody who's going to be honest. That mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who it is. It's are you going to tell the audience stories? Mm -hmm. And I... I People say, well, who are your favorite guest? I always say the person who is not wasting the audience's time, mm -hmm. that they'll stay in their car for them because they're, they're telling stories. So as long as you're doing that, it's when somebody is evasive. You know, I always say nobody can say nothing for a longer period of time than Derek Jeter. <laughs> but but he, was, he was very gracious. You know, Tiger doesn't really say anything. Mm -hmm. So those, those interviews don't excite me or those people don't. It's when you get somebody who you can, you know, lay down the breadcrumbs and they have something to say, you know, that that's when you have that radio magic. How do you handle Dan? And this happens to me sometimes, and I'm sure to a, maybe to some extent it does to you. Guests who come with the um, conditions like, well, we would love to do it, but uh, we do not want to be asked about this. And I would really like to avoid this topic. How do you handle that? Normally you'll get somebody, a PR person who will say that mm -hmm. and they'll, and then you go, well, I wasn't going to ask that, but the fact that you brought it up <laughs> makes me want to ask that. Sure. Dan, you're doing really well. Question number seven, sailing. Sailing is the category, Dan. Not saline or sailing? Not, not saline like the solution. Sailing okay. with an I-N-G, you're out there okay. on a boat. Okay, sailing. What does the boating term starboard mean? That would be uh, turning left. He says turning left. Is that correct? That is incorrect. Oh, yeah. oh, Starboard is to the right. Oh! <laughs> port. Yeah. The okay. port would be to the left. Okay. Um, but I'm not, okay. I, I'm not even asking about sailing. I'm actually <laughs> genuinely fascinated about Full Sail University. And just so everybody listening knows, this is obviously not something, this is not a pitch, this is not a plug. This is about Dan's life. And Dan, you started something, Full Sail University. Tell people exactly what this is. It's, we started almost four years ago. We mm -hmm. started with four students and we wanted to create a, a, a degree program at Full Sail University where you get your degree in sports casting. Not broadcasting, not communications. That we're teaching you how to be a sportscaster, how to write uh, on camera, behind the camera, report, uh, direct, produce, all of these things. And Full Sail, they've been wonderful because they do this, you know, this um, online or on campus in Orlando, Florida. And I just remember when four students signed up and I just said, look, you know, I'll never forget you because they believed in me. And we, you know, even if it four students, it's one of the greatest achievements I've ever accomplished because I, I just remember no one gave me the answers to the test when I was growing up. I, you know, I didn't know how to get in this business. And I thought if we could create something like this, where, you know, I can say to the parents, if this is what your, your kids want to do, then, then we'll help you. 
and and we're the umbilical cord that will stay with you. When you get a job, we want to stay in touch with you. And we have over 400 students now, over 100 graduates, but it started with four. And I said, word of mouth will get out for people in the industry. Uh, and also with just students talking to other students or parents. And I, I have people that I worked with at the mothership. We have over 200 years of experience with everybody in the faculty. And, and we tell you what the business is like. We have guest speakers there. It, I mean, it's really, it, it's, it's one of the best things I ever did because you see them when they start and you see that growth and then they get a job. We got students, graduates who are on air around the country. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity, humbled by that. But, you know, that hopefully is my legacy that I leave, that I, I you know, we're helping these students achieve a dream. And uh, when they graduate, I get emotional. You know, I, I, I get, I start crying because mm -hmm. you see them when they first get there. Mm -hmm. And when they realize I, I have something that no other school, I mean, there are other schools that are wonderful, you know, Syracuse, Arizona state, sure. Northwestern, there's, there's so many, we do it different. You know, we're not where you're going to have keg keggers and fraternities. And your this, your first job is when you go to school. So thank you for letting me talk about it, but it's, it's an opportunity to, watch somebody grow mm -hmm. and you stay in touch with them. And even the core four, we stay in touch with them. And I hope that I stay in touch with them the rest of my life. I think it's cool that they're the core four. I, I, I really do. I, I, and I, I'm even going to follow on this, Dan, because I, I, I know a lot of people who are very successful in media and they, they don't have anything like this, nor are they interested in doing anything like this because you don't have to, you want to, and it gives you joy um, can you, can you boil it down? It's, it's very difficult, but it's for all the people that you get and that I, I get even on a much, much more modest level who say, dear Dan Patrick, or excuse me, Dan Patrick, I, I want to do so badly what you do. You have my yeah. dream job. What should I do? What is your advice? What can you even begin to tell them? Well, I, that's how I started the school because I kept thinking that I had a student who graduated from, and I don't want to say the school, but it was an SEC school. Okay. And, and I met with his parents and they said, you know, he hasn't gotten a job. And I said, well, I'll talk to him. And then he, he hadn't been on the school newspaper, the school radio station. I like hadn't done an intern, nothing. And I thought, you know, are schools just taking your money, spitting you out, and then you're on your own. And, and I thought, is there, a, is there a way that we could come up with a program, a degree? Could we partner with somebody and that we could help them? And that's how it started. Mm -hmm. I, I, heard, I hear from so many people, how do you get started in the business? Mm -hmm. Well, I just say, go to Full Sail University because that's how you get started in the business because you're on the air. You're treated like you're a professional. Like you're mm -hmm. treated like this is a job. You got to show up on time. You know, you got to do all the things that you do, the dirty work, understand cameras, mm -hmm. uh, understand the director, uh, you know, how to put an IFB in, all of these things mm -hmm. that, Nobody told us what to do. My first time I was ever on the air at CNN, my microphone didn't work. First time telling my family, I'm going to be on. It was a sports cut in afternoon and my microphone didn't work. News anchor grabs his microphone while I'm talking on camera. I don't know my microphone's not on. And he puts his microphone on my tie oh my and God. I just keep talking. And then I get done and I threw it back to Lou Waters and Lou goes, uh, you know, can I have my microphone back? Yep, there it is right there. And I went, holy shit, what just happened? But, you know, you, you want them to understand the highs and lows and it's difficult. You know, you want to get married. You want to have kids. Yeah. The better you are, the worse your hours are. Sure. You know, can you live in, you know, Bozeman, Montana? Can you live in, you know, Poughkeepsie? Can you, if you really want to do this, and everybody wants to be in New York or L.A., uh, Chicago. Sure. And I said, you won't be there. But if you want to do this, you may not make great money, but you get to you get to do this every single day. And then and it kind of opens their eyes to you can be a producer. You can be a director. You can be in the business. You don't you're not the next Joe Buck or Bob Costas, whoever it is. And, and that's what you love to hear. You love to see that because then it starts to sink in a little bit. It's a great answer. Full Sail University is a very cool thing. Dan, we have three questions left. 
You are five out of seven. We can finish as high as an eight, which is a prolific score. This is everybody's favorite category. Everybody does it. Question number eight is finish the lyric. I have for you a popular piece of music. You're gonna hear the lyricist sing or rap or do whatever they do. It's gonna stop on a dime. And when it stops, the floor will be yours to finish the lyric. Here we go. Question number eight with Dan Patrick. Dan, finish the lyric. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go. Sometimes you want to go where the... Uh, can I use Todd Fritz as a lifeline, Kyle? Absolutely not. You already oh. used my lifeline and you used yeah, the poster. Yeah, but your lifeline sucked. He's terrible. Just awful. Sometimes you want to go. go. Where do you want to go? Oh, Dan, you know this one. I know, I know I you know it. I know. Where, where what? Sometimes you want to go where what? Do you know the source <laughs> material? Do you know what it's from? Uh, it's from a TV show. Yep. It's from a Ted Danson. Yep. TV show about a bar. You, you clink yes. your glasses together and you say, "Can I? Can I hear it one more time?" Of course you can, Dan Patrick. Sometimes you want to go. Give him the whole thing. It's twenty seconds. Just okay. get into it. Right. Here you go. Play it again. Name the song. Okay. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go. Where everybody knows your name. Yeah, <laughs> we did it. That's it, roll it. Oh my God. Where everybody knows your name. Dan, you feel good? And they're always glad you came. See, you want to go where everybody knows your name. Your name. Okay. All right. How do you feel? You okay? Uh, you know, I'm, I just, I kind of roughed up here a little bit. No, no, no. You know, I almost, I, no, I almost blew the, the Drew Barrymore question. This one, I actually went to the Friends Bar when they had it in Boston. The Cheers Bar. Uh, a cheers bar. Yeah. Yes. I, and and I, I, I'm outside and I go, oh, we got to go in. And you go in and then it doesn't look like the bar. <laughs> and I went, wait, what? The, this sucks. But um, I always said Woody Harrelson, one of the great characters in that. Yeah. Loved, loved Woodman. Okay. No, Woody playing the character of Woody. I'm playing cheers <laughs> because... Uh, Dan, 2007, you leave ESPN. Infamously, it was written by Rick Riley that it was Shelley Long leaving Cheers, quote, one of the top <laughs> five worst career mistakes in entertainment history when yeah. you leaving ESPN. Do you remember that? And was that was that your like Mel Kuyper draft slights and, and you're never going to become anything? Did, did that motivate you as a broadcaster? Well, there was a, a backstory to it that I had helped Rick Riley with his transition to ESPN. Mm -hmm. And so I was disappointed in Rick saying that. Sure. Um, Cause we were friends, but look, I mean, it's a good line. It's just not an accurate line because I, in my mind, I was betting on myself, but really I needed to leave ESPN because I wasn't getting any better mm. in my mind. I was going through the motions and I just thought I need to get back out there and get my ass kicked. And I thought, okay, let me bet on myself. Now, six weeks later, when I left the mothership and I'm on the porch by myself and I'm there with the dog and everybody's gone and I'm thinking I made a huge mistake. But I just remember going, if you're any good, then you'll salvage this. And uh, I had opportunities, NBC with uh, the Olympics and football night in America. Uh, to do my own radio show. So I, I had possibilities. It was just everybody was jumping to the conclusion of nobody leaves ESPN unless you're told to leave ESPN. Mm -hmm. I chose to leave ESPN. And it came down to one simple thing, though. I wanted to do my radio show on Friday. 
at home. That was it. Mm-hmm. Monday through Thursday, I would do it at the mothership. I'd still do Sports Center. And I just, I was missing my kids growing up. So my kids were, you know, nine through 15, four kids. And I was going to re sign at ESPN. I was going to sign a new five year deal. And I remember that morning, my wife said, Are you sure you want to do this? I'm like, Yeah, of course I do. Yeah, hell yeah. And then she said, They're, they're going to all be out of the house. They're, they're going to be all out of the house when you're done with this. And I'm not even thinking that. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, Okay, they're going to pay me this. Yeah, of course. I got to do X number of shows. I got to do this. And uh, I went up that morning. And I, it took me 55 minutes to drive to ESPN. And I remember going in and I went upstairs and then my boss said, so uh, what are you going to do? Take it or leave it. And I paused and I said, I'm, I'm going to leave it. And he didn't hear me. He just said, all right, well, you know what? I'll have Danielle get the contract for you. And I, I said, no, I'm, I'm going to leave. He goes, you're going to leave. I said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave. And I remember walking outside, clear blue sky. I mean, a beautiful day. And I called my, my wife and I said, hon, I'm, I'm coming home. She goes, okay. And I said, no, I, I'm coming home. I'm, I'm going to quit ESPN. She goes, if we have to sell the house, we'll sell the house. That's when it hit me of she had perspective. I had none. You know, I'm, I'm on TV. I'm making great money. She's raising the kid. Like, you know, I was just, I was so blind to it. And thank God I came home. I was doing the radio show up in my attic for three, three years. We're in the attic. I'd have the Danettes come in and we go up to the attic. And my wife loved it. You would think, you know, that coming in the house, seven in the morning, Danettes going through the back up the steps, you know, she's in her bathrobe, (laughs) you know, yelling at kids, getting them out of the house. It, it was, it was unbelievable. And it, and I have three daughters and it was so important to be around them because they were, you know, nine, yeah. uh, 11 and 12. And it, you know, they needed, they needed me there. I didn't know how much. Mm-hmm. And even my son who was 15, uh, best decision I ever made. Mm-hmm. But when Rick said it, it was a funny line, but I don't think Rick hears when somebody says something about him and laughs the same way as what he says. And, you know, occasionally on, on the show, I'll, I'll, I'll bring up Rick Riley. Like, what's Rick Riley doing now? He finally reached out to the show yeah. and said, uh, oh, I've written uh, four treatments and a screenplay. Sure. And, uh, and then I just said to uh, one of my guys, I said, just tell Rick, oh, good. Uh, I'm glad you're doing well. And that's it. But, yeah, Rick, Rick had a good shot there. But, um, you know, not many people leave. More people leave uh, ESPN now. Because they re- like if you escape from Alcatraz sure. and you don't know if they made it to shore, you assume the sharks got them. <laughs> right. I made it to shore. And then other, <laughs> other people followed suit after that, that it was okay to leave the mothership. That's awesome. Yeah, a pioneer in that sense. And I mean that. We have two questions left, Dan. Let's okay. wrap this thing up. All right. Two questions go. left. Right. Question number nine. Your category is fire. Dan, 451 degrees. Is the temperature at which with what substance burns? Is the temperature at which what substance burns? So 451 Fahrenheit. Yes, sir. Uh, I will say metal. The correct answer is uh, paper. It's the, the, the degrees at which paper burns. Uh, Fahrenheit 451, we had to read the book in high school. I'm sure you did too. It's paper. I didn't Um, read the book. You (laughs) You went to an Ivy League school, okay? Uh, And I was an English major. So maybe that, what was your major? You said, what what was it? Beer. (laughs) (laughs) PPR. It it was was communications. Okay. It was communications. I'm asking though about uh, burning and, and fire. Because something you and I have talked about before, you're nothing in this business allegedly these days without some heat on your takes. And yet you are sort of, I feel like in, in one of ways, like the last cowboys in the sense that you talk sports, you pose questions, but you don't have this need to outblaze the competition or yourself. 
How do you do it at this point when everyone is just take, 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 and you just talk sports? How do you do it? I was never taught that way. Mm -hmm. That, and, and and look, I've been criticized because I don't have hot takes, but you know, those hot takes get a lot colder when they don't come true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I just want to approach it in a professional manner that I don't want to be sensationalistic or, you know, titillating, you know, I'd never troll you. I'll mm -hmm. never do that. Mm -hmm. It's just, this is my opinion. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with going, I don't know. I know. When somebody says, oh, this guy's going to be a great play. This guy has no chance of being successful. Like no chance. <laughs> I get, if he's playing, he has a chance. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I just wanted, I wanted to be fair. I wanted to be fair to the person or the coach or the story, the game, whatever it is, just be fair. And instead of this jump from A to Z, there's nothing wrong with stopping at E or F. And when I was brought up, I was brought up in this CNN mentality that you push the product out. Even when I got to the mothership, you push the product out. It's different when it's your name, but still I approach it in the same manner of be, approach it in a professional manner. That's all. So you're right. I, I see guys who do hot takes and they do really well. They do. And they get paid well. Um, it's just not in my DNA that I, I want to, I'm not going to change now. I'm 65. So it's not like you go, you know, started to think about this hot take stuff. I think I'm going to do it. Not going to yeah. go well. It's kind of the yellow Corvette and hair plugs of on-air content. It just doesn't ever really sell well. But I did my research, Dan. I was trying to find some hot takes. I even went so far. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the Twitter account, Freezing Cold Takes, that collects yep. people's takes that go wrong. I contacted the guy named Fred Siegel. And I go, Fred, what do you got on Patrick? I'm sure you have files on everybody. There must be some. And this guy who knows everybody's takes about everything said, honestly, I don't have anything on Patrick. He had bubkiss. Are there any takes that you remember, Dan, where you're like, wow, that one really aged terribly? Oh, I'm sure there are, Kyle. Mm -hmm. I, but I'm trying to think. Um, you know, you you thought Russell Wilson wasn't going to amount to anything, or it just, or you thought someone did was going to, and then they just didn't. We and we all have them, even if you're not trying. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think who. Um, I thought that uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. from the Grizzlies was going to be the best player from that draft instead of Luca. That's uh, good. Yeah, yeah. You had a feeling and, and I, about Jared Jackson Jr. I still stand by that, Kyle, <laughs> that he's going to be better than Luca and Trey Young. That's great. No, I, I don't. I have opinions. Yeah, of course. But but what happens is I always I, I always want to ask somebody if I don't if I don't know it, then you can ask a source and then they can tell you. And then that way, at least it feels like it comes from a good place instead of let me just spout this. Yes. When you talk to somebody who, so, you know, case in point, um, I said that the big 10 was not going to play football during the pandemic. Okay. And I had a, I got crushed by the college football insiders. And I, I said, no, this is coming from a source that I trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I said, and if the big 10 shuts down the pack, 12 is going to shut down. And then it happened. And, you know, nobody says, Hey, sorry about that. Didn't mean to rip you. You, you know, but I had it from a source who was telling me, uh, I came in one uh, Monday morning of the draft and I said, Hey, just got off the phone with a source. Baker Mayfield's going number one. Mm. And I said it on the air to the Danettes because I wanted to see them surprised. And I had people, you know, in Cleveland saying, you know, how do you know? Blah, blah, blah. I said, I, I have a great source on this. I'm not wrong on this. Yeah. And, and so, those are the takes, but the takes are backed up by somebody who would know instead of me just going, I think Baker Mayfield. I mean, I could say that. I find it more interesting when you know Baker Mayfield's going to be number one, not, you know, I had it uh, from a reliable source that Seattle wanted to trade Russell Wilson to Cleveland yeah. and they were going to take Josh Allen. Mm -hmm. And I, but I, 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 I didn't go with that at the time because I had the Baker Mayfield story going number one, but Seattle was going to trade Russ, get the number one pick or a couple of number yeah. one picks. And they you know, so that was going to happen. They, they love Josh Allen. So that, I guess that's usually what happens. If I get criticized, it's because maybe my source uh, wasn't correct, right. but no, I, I just don't dive into the, you know, 
he here notice me. Sure. You know, I got something to say. Probably felt pretty sweet when the Browns said Baker Mayfield instead of Sam. Well, Darnold you know, the, the, you know, there's. It, be careful what you ask for when you break stories, yeah. because they don't credit you when you're right, but when you're wrong, <laughs> man, they are coming at you. I had a source yeah. say that the the uh, college football playoff committee wanted to vote for 2023 uh-huh. for the playoffs. And, and my source is impeccable. Uh-huh. And I, I said that they would like to vote on this, maybe get it started 2023. If not, then it's going to go 2025. I got crucified. Yeah. I got crushed. Like, you know, stop making stuff up. And, and I went, okay, I'm going to take the bullet here. Mm-hmm. But if I said who my source was, then people would go, I understand why you went with that. Uh, Look, you take the slings and arrows, and if somebody tells you something, then okay, goes along with the territory. We all put on big boy pants every day, so it's it's the nature of the beast. You've taken all the slings and arrows here, and we get down to the last question. You are six out of nine. You can finish with a very classy seven out of ten. Dan, question ten is the same for every person in the fact that it's an essay question. An essay paper, question. Paper. 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 Four hundred fifty-one degrees. The essay question means, Dan, I have found an opinion of yours, maybe even a take that's a little spicy, that I don't know if I agree with. I'm going to present that opinion of yours, and then the floor is yours to sell me on that. If I feel it's a compelling (laughs) argument, I'll give you the point. If not, you finish with a 6 out of 10. Here we go. Question number 10 for Dan Patrick, who's been very, very generous with his time and very insightful. Dan. And I've been labeled a 6 out of 10 before, Kyle, so I am fine with that. It has been explained to me that you do not like the films, The Godfather and Goodfellas, that they're not for you. The floor is yours to explain why these almost universally beloved films are not for you and why you're right in that opinion. Go ahead. Okay, my wife is Italian. And of course, you know, her aunts and uncles, when we get around, we do not talk about the mafia. We do not talk about Sopranos. We don't talk about uh, Godfather, even though they love Brando. Uh, we do not talk about Goodfellas because that doesn't exist. The, that organized crime does not exist. And you can't mention. Now, you can mention Pacino and De Niro because they're Italian actors, mm-hmm. but you can't mention that they were great in Godfather mm-hmm. or Godfather 2, that that does not come up. So while I would like to watch the movies and I've watched bits and pieces out of respect to my wife and her family, I do not watch those movies. Wow. So if you're at Thanksgiving dinner and your, your wife and her family are there and, and somebody says, oh, Dan, you're funny. You can't be like, what do you mean funny? How the fuck am I funny? What, you, you would never go that route. No. no. God, that's not where I thought you were going to go with it. And that's so much more of a better answer than I just don't like Ray Liotta's portrayal because everybody likes it. <laughs> uh, Dan, you got it right. And you got a seven out of ten. Oh, you have my finished. God. The yes. 10 questions. Oh, oh my gosh. I'm With ex- a seven. How do you feel? I'm exhausted. <laughs> I am. I, I'm exhausted. You know, that's, oh, I, I like asking questions. I, I don't like completely. answering questions. We yeah. had a, a, a very, very, very successful team owner on this, t- on this show who has been through a lot. And he said the same thing when it was over. He said, I was so nervous the entire time. We learned a lot, Dan. The only other thing I'll push you for is very simple because everybody does it. Uh, I just need a call out from you. One call out of any public figure in the world who you think should come in and compete with your seven out of 10 in this dojo, an athlete, an actor, anybody at all, who comes to mind? You've got a a pretty good guest list of people who've already come in. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. Are you, are you... Oh, so you're a little desperate. That's why you got me on the show. Oh, no, okay. No, 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 no. I all. see what you're doing. How dare you, Patrick? I, How, we have you doing lined al- up for weeks. Alphabetically, are you doing it that way? Like, what, what is going on here, Kyle? <laughs> no, I've been on your show a couple times. I've always really enjoyed it. And I had a lot of cool research about you. And I said, get Patrick in here. Now all you need to do to leave and calm down is just give me one call. It could be anybody. Do you want it to be Sandler? Do you want it to be your guy from the mm. Grizzlies who you thought was going to be mm. the best player in the draft? Anybody. <laughs> <want it. laughs> uh, who do I think you should have on? Somebody from media. Anybody at all. Your call. Who would, who would be good in this and maybe take down your 7 out of 10? David Spade. David Spade. That's fascinating. Why Spade? I love Spade. I think Spade is the funniest guy out of Sandler and uh-huh. Rock 
and Schneider, uh, you know, Kevin James. Yeah. When you're around Spade, he is he is sneaky quick. And he is, they'll all tell you, Rock, Sandler, they'll all tell you, Spade's the funniest guy. And he's really good with just, you know, improvisational, here you go. Got a question, what do you got for me? He's, wow. he's, he's very sharp. Uh, so he might be good understanding, you know, the sort of back and forth. Okay. I don't know if he'll give you the backdrop on a lot of things, but like I did. Yeah. Uh, but, but he is a, a quick back and forth there. Um, that is a great call out, Dan. You were an incredible contestant. We learned a lot, a lot. And <laughs> this is a gentleman who sent in an audition tape when he was choosing cable over heat way back in the day. He yeah. left ESPN. He also transferred to Dayton. He did it all, including starting Full Sail University, which is incredible. Dan Patrick, you are so cool and so generous. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. And good luck. We appreciate it.